Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be covering how to take beautiful Milky Way photos, explaining the entire process from start to finish. Let's get started. Before we start, I just want to thank my sponsor for this video, Sonata Music. Sonata is a music licensing platform for content creators and filmmakers, featuring high quality music at competitive rates. Sonata's personal plan costs just $9.90 per month, and unlike other platforms, they don't lock you into a contract, and any content you publish using Sonata songs is covered for life, even if you cancel later. Sonata has high quality music prioritizing quality over quantity, and all of their music comes from actual artists. Searching for music is quick and easy, and there are thousands of tracks to choose from. Click the link in the description for my unique signup code that gets you your first month free. To start taking Milky Way photos, you'll need some gear. First, make sure you have a camera with manual mode. Having a manual mode will be important since we'll be adjusting the camera's settings ourselves. If you have a DSLR or mirrorless camera, chances are it already has this functionality. Next, you'll want a wide-angle lens with a large aperture. Lenses with focal lengths anywhere from 12mm to 35mm are considered wide-angle and are a favorite for astrophotographers. This is because the wide-angle field of view is able to capture the vastness of the Milky Way, which stretches across the sky. Keep in mind that if you have a camera with a larger or smaller sensor than full frame, you will need to adjust the field of view measurement by a crop factor that is specific to your type of camera. For example, if I'm using my Sony a7S, which is a full frame camera, with a 20mm lens, the lens will have a field of view of 20mm. But on a Sony a6000, which is an APS-C size sensor, not a full frame sensor, the lens has a field of view of around 30 millimeters since I had to multiply the original field of view by the sensor crop factor of 1.5. Crop sensors for common sensor types are on screen now. The field of view of your lens after applying the crop factor is important to know since it may affect your purchasing decisions and the field of view seen through your lens is an important number that we will use later. A wide aperture is also an important quality when choosing an astro lens. A lens's aperture controls how much light is able to pass through the lens into the camera. A wider aperture means the physical opening that allows light through is larger, meaning more light is collected on the camera's sensor. In astrophotography, the stars and galaxies we photograph are very faint, so our goal is to collect as much light as possible, and by using as large of an aperture as we can, we can maximize the starlight we collect. Apertures are expressed as F numbers or F stops. Lower F numbers correspond to larger apertures, which might seem a little counterintuitive. So an aperture of f2.8 is larger than an aperture of f5.6 and much larger than an aperture of f11. This means that lower F numbers also mean more light is being collected by the lens, since wider apertures let in more light. For astrophotography, apertures of f2.8 or larger are recommended, but really you can create astrophotos with any aperture with varying degrees of success. With the camera and lens covered, the final necessary item you will need will be a tripod. As we will cover later, astrophotography requires using long shutter speeds where the camera is exposing a photo for many seconds. Any motion caused by camera shake will therefore cause the stars to blur and essentially ruin your photo, so to keep the camera rock solid, you'll want to use a tripod. Any sturdy tripod will do the job. Not required but extremely useful is a remote shutter release either wired or wireless. This allows you to control the shutter of the camera without having to physically press the shutter button, which can cause a little bit of camera shake. Also, in some remote shutter modes, you can set the camera to automatically take photos in sequence, which can be used to create a time lapse using computer software. Other helpful gear includes light pollution filters, which can help reduce light pollution and enhance starlight, Batonov mask filters, which help you precisely focus your lens on stars, and star trackers, which, when aligned with the celestial pole, can rotate the camera at the exact speed to counteract Earth's rotation, helping to mitigate the effects of star trailing, allowing you to use longer shutter speeds that can drastically improve the quality of your astrophotos. For creative effects, you can use flashlights or LED video lights to light paint dark foregrounds, and headlamps and light orbs can help add an extra element to astro selfies. Now that we have gear covered, let's go over camera settings. Having control over your camera settings with a manual mode is important, since we will be adjusting the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO ourselves. First, let's tackle the aperture. As I stated earlier, a larger aperture means more light is collected by the camera, so for astrophotography we want to use the largest aperture we can, right? 
Well, yes, but due to the laws of physics, at larger apertures lenses are less sharp, have more vignetting, and may suffer from aberrations which cause stars to become deformed. My advice is to test your lens and find out at what aperture the results become acceptable for you. If you have a good astro lens, you might not see any issues with shooting wide open at the lens's maximum aperture. But if your lens shows a loss in quality, you may need to stop down the aperture slightly to see improvement. Still, you want to use the widest aperture you can to maximize the amount of light you can gather. Next is shutter speed. Longer shutter speeds will allow you to collect more light, just like using a wider aperture will, and in astrophotography, we want to use the longest shutter speed we can without causing the stars to trail. While it's hard to notice in real time, because of the Earth's rotation, the stars appear to move across the night sky at a rate of about 15 degrees westward per hour. This subtle movement can be seen when using very long shutter speeds, the motion blur from the stars causing trails. While star trail photography is an entire genre of its own, for regular astrophotos, we want the stars to be round and sharp. The right shutter speed to use for astrophotography is the longest shutter speed without star trails. This maximizes the exposure of the image while keeping the stars round, which is what we want. To find this right shutter speed, we can use some math. The 500 rule is a simple calculation of the number 500 divided by the field of view of your lens adjusted for crop factor that will give you the correct shutter speed to use for astrophotography. For example, on a Sony A6000, which is an APS-C size sensor with a crop factor of 1.5, using a 15mm lens would give you a shutter speed of around 22 seconds. Now, like all things in photography, finding the right shutter speed isn't always as easy as using the 500 rule. On high megapixel cameras, stars take up less space on the sensor and trails are more easily seen. So, adopting a 400 or 300 rule may be necessary. If you want to get really technical, you can use the NPF rule. The NPF rule replaces the simple number of 500 on the top of the fraction with 35 multiplied by the aperture of the lens plus 30 times the pixel pitch of the camera. Remember your order of operations from high school. Do the calculation inside the parentheses before dividing by your focal length. The formula is 35 times aperture plus 30 times pixel pitch divided by focal length. The NPF rule is great because it helps correct for star trailing seen on high megapixel sensors. Given two identically sized sensors, the one with more megapixels will have a higher density of pixels. The pixels will be smaller. The measurement of how large these pixels are is called pixel pitch, which we see in the NPF rule. Smaller pixels will make star trails more visible than with larger pixels when the images are viewed up close. We can see this in the comparison shot on my Sony a7S with 12.2 megapixels versus the a7R2 with 42.2 megapixels. Both cameras have full frame size sensors, but the pixel pitch of the A7S is much larger. Adjusting for this when using the MPF rule, we can see the star trails on the A7R2 virtually disappear. So, to recap shutter speed, we want to use the longest shutter speed we can before our stars begin to trail. The 500 rule is a good starting point in finding this shutter speed, taking the number 500 and dividing it by your lens's field of view, adjusted for crop factor, but the NPF rule is a more accurate calculation, using your camera's sensor's pixel pitch and aperture along with your lens's field of view. Now for the last setting, ISO. In photography, ISO is often referred to as a sensitivity of the image sensor, but this is a misconception and an especially dangerous one for astrophotographers. ISO is just amplification of the light already gathered by the sensor. If aperture and shutter speed control exposure, then ISO controls brightness, much like the exposure slider in Lightroom. As such, a good rule for choosing ISO is to first craft the exposure with your aperture and calculated shutter speed, then use ISO until your photo is properly brightened with the shadows not clipped nor highlights blown. ISO will vary quite a lot depending on your scene and conditions. During a full moon or under heavy light pollution, you may use an ISO of 100 to 400, while under the darkest skies, your ISO may have to be 6400 to 12800. So, to recap, for aperture, you want to use the largest aperture you can as long as the image quality is acceptable to you. For shutter speed, you want to use the 500 rule or ideally the NPF rule to find the longest shutter speed you can without the stars trailing. And for ISO, you'll want to adjust until your image is properly bright. Now, let's move into the next section of this video where we'll actually go and shoot some Milky Way photos. If you're going out to take photos of the stars, the first thing you will need is clear skies. 
Clouds are the bane of astrophotographers, and you need to plan around them. Predicting weather is never 100% accurate, but I like to use windy.com for cloud forecasts and real-time satellite views to find spots with clear skies. Next, you will need to find dark skies, and by dark, I mean without any light pollution. In major urban areas, the collective light from thousands or millions of street lamps, cars, and buildings spills upward into the sky, making faint stars invisible and dimming all but the brightest ones. In major metropolitan areas, it can be hard to see the Milky Way at all, and light pollution bubbles from these cities can stretch for miles even beyond the city limits. Light pollution maps can help you find areas that are dark enough for you and your camera to see the stars. Once you find a dark spot, make sure you account for neighboring cities whose light pollution may be visible on the horizon, since the Milky Way core is often photographed over landscapes, which may be in the direction of urban areas. This leads us nicely into the Milky Way itself and how to find it. As you probably know, the Milky Way is the galaxy that the Earth, Sun, and our solar system orbit around. Most of the stars in the night sky are within our own galaxy, but the Milky Way that everyone points to in the sky in photographs is actually a long strip of stars that spans the entire sky, our view of the galaxy edge on. The center of our galaxy is often the most photographed part of the Milky Way, appearing as a bright section full of stars and dust lanes. Because of the Earth's tilt, the galactic core, or just the core, as it's commonly referred to, is not visible at all times of the year, and when it is visible, its position on the horizon changes day to day. The best way to find the Milky Way and know what parts are visible is to use a planetarium software like Stellarium, which is free for your computer or phone, or augmented reality apps like SkyGuide, where you can move your phone around the sky and see what stars you're looking at in real time. Once you are on location and know what you want to shoot, the next step is to set up your tripod and camera and focus on the stars. Focusing during the day is easy. Your autofocus can handle almost any situation, and the available light makes it easy to see when you've missed focus. But at night, autofocus is completely useless, so we will need to manually focus our lens on the stars. The best method of focusing on the stars is by enabling the live view on your camera, using the focus magnifier or zoom button to enlarge a bright star, then using the focus wheel on the lens to get the star as small as possible. Some lenses have a hard stop, where the focus wheel stops turning once the lens is focused at infinity. If your lens has this, then simply turn the lens all the way to infinity and you should be set. Remember to always verify your stars are in focus by taking a test shot and making adjustments if the stars are blurry. Getting the right focus is very important, so take your time with this step. Once you have your focus set, dial your correct camera settings and take the shot. That's all it takes. While single shot astrophotography is the simplest way to take photos, there are some techniques you can use to improve image quality. Taking multiple exposures of the same scene allows you to stack them with software. Image stacking averages multiple exposures to reduce noise and increase detail. I'll briefly go over how to stack images later in this video. Another thing you can do to increase image quality is to take two images, one exposed for the sky and one for the foreground. During extremely dark nights, the foreground is very dark, often too dark to be well exposed with your calculated settings, causing lots of noise to appear in those areas when the ISO is increased or when lifting the shadows in post-processing. Using a much longer shutter speed, say 2 or 3 minutes, to expose for the foreground and blending the new shot with the original star image can leave you with an image that is less noisy. Combine this method with image stacking and you can drastically improve image quality. If your lens's field of view is too narrow, you can also take an astro panorama. Simply move your camera around the sky, taking photos of different sections of the Milky Way. Make sure you have enough overlap between your shots. After you have all the images, process them and stitch them into a panorama. I recommend Microsoft Ice or PT GUI for stitching panoramas, but most RAW processors have a panorama tool built in that should work fine. Speaking of RAW processors, let's go over my workflow for editing Milky Way images. My editing workflow mostly centers on Adobe Lightroom, so that's what I'll be covering. After importing all your photos, you're going to want to apply lens corrections and remove any chromatic aberration with the Color Picker tool. Our first real edit will be to adjust the white balance to get rid of any color cast. To do this, we can do this little trick, where we max out the saturation vibrance of the image, then adjust the temperature until there's roughly an even amount of cool and warm colors in the image. Then after that, we reset the saturation and vibrance sliders, and we are left with a natural image. 
After that, I usually correct the brightness of the image with the exposure slider just in case I didn't get it right in camera. Then I'll increase the contrast in the image and adjust the tone curve from a straight line to a subtle S shape to further add contrast. I'll often increase clarity and add a bit of dehaze in the image as well. I like to apply selective edits to just the Milky Way band, so I'll use the adjustment brush tool and paint in some added exposure, dehaze, clarity, and saturation. In this shot, the sky is looking a little too gray, so I'm going to paint the entire sky with another one of those custom adjustment brushes so I can lower the blacks, being careful not to include the foreground since it's already pretty dark. So now I'm pretty happy with the image, and I'm going to save it as a JPEG and a TIFF. I always keep the raw files and save my photos as TIFFs in case I want to do edits on them later. Now I mentioned stacking earlier in the video, so let's cover that. In fact, for the photo I just edited, I took a sequence of images exposed for the foreground as well as a separate sequence for the sky. There are a lot of ways you can approach this workflow, but I like to edit my photos first before stacking them. Conveniently, I had the edited photos for the foreground and the sky here already. I like to use a free program called Sequitur to stack my images, since you can specify what areas of the image you want to be stacked. I'll import my sky photos and stack them, export the stack photo as a TIFF, then import my ground photos, stack those, and export that as another TIFF. Now that I have the two stacked images, one for the foreground and one for the sky, I will combine them in Photoshop. Once I have both layers in Photoshop, I'm going to create a mask and simply paint out the part of the image I don't want so that I can see both the stacked images. When I have a result that looks natural, I'll flatten the image, export that as a TIFF and a JPEG, and I'm done. Sometimes seeing both the foreground and sky together makes you want to re-edit the image, so I might apply further edits in Lightroom, but right out of Photoshop, this one looks really good. So with post-processing covered, that wraps up my complete guide to Milky Way photography. In this video, we covered the gear, settings, shooting process, and editing workflow that can create great Milky Way photos. To recap, all you need to capture the Milky Way is a tripod, camera with manual mode, and a wide aperture lens. For settings, you will want to experiment for yourself, but I recommend using the largest aperture on your lens, a shutter speed that is calculated by the NPF rule, or 500 rule, and an ISO that leaves the image looking bright enough so that no data is lost in the shadows or highlights. The editing process is even more subjective, but I like to use Lightroom for the majority of my workflow. With all this information, you should be well on your way to creating great Milky Way photos. Thanks for watching, and I wish everyone good luck and clear skies. Thank you so much for watching this Apple photography video. If you would like to support the channel, the best way is through subscribing with notifications so that you don't miss any new content. Feel free to rate and share the video, and if you have any feedback, I will try my hardest to respond to your comments and incorporate any suggestions into future videos. If you prefer to read my content instead of watching it, or want to view other helpful articles, tutorials, and learn more about Apple Apps, then visit my new website, appleapps.org. To follow me on my photography adventures, visit my Instagram page, at Vincent Ledvina, and also my print store. Finally, consider joining my Patreon for one-on-one -on -one support and extra content, check out my Buy Me a Coffee page, visit my merch store to buy clothing with unique Apple App style designs, and as always, PayPal donations are an option. All these resources will be linked in the description. With that, thank you for watching and I hope all of you have a great day.